Good afternoon or good evening, uh, dear audience, depending on wherever in the world you may be. On behalf of the Department of Law, North South University, it is my pleasure and privilege to welcome you to this webinar by Professor Hang Wang. Before I say a few words about Professor Wang's topic, let me very briefly say a few words about Professor Wang himself. Professor Hang Wang is co-director of Harvard Smith Free Hills China International Business and Economic Law Center, University of New South Wales Law and Justice, the largest center in this field outside China. Wang, uh, Hang was named Australia's research field leader in international law by the Australian Newspapers Research 2020 magazine. He has been a recipient of major awards and grants. Currently, he is a chief investigator of a project related to the future of regional economic governance funded by the Australian Research Council, along with his CIBL colleagues. His work explores the future of international economic relationship and law development, often from Chinese and regional perspectives. His present focus is on law and technology, particularly central bank digital currency. He has advised or spoken at events organized by international organizations and institutions such as APEC, BIS, ICC, UNCITRAL, WTO, and the private sector. Now, the, to this topic, the topic on which Professor Wang would be speaking for us, it's a topic that has garnered a lot of interest among not just lawyers or law students, but I guess among journalists, among people who are working in the field of finance and other related area. The central bank digital currency, or particularly the Chinese central bank digital currency, which is the theme of today's webinar. Unlike some other digital currencies, Chinese central bank digital currency is a legal tender so as I understand it, the businesses within China would not have an option to accept or not to accept these like the private digital currencies. And this is not just a Chinese project, as I understand, around 15 or so countries across the world are exploring these in one form or another. And unlike the private currency, digital currencies, the so-called cryptocurrencies like Bitcoins, I don't think this Chinese central bank digital currency is about anonymity. It's more about uh, regulation and perhaps disclosure. And I, as I perceive it, it is not just about eco an economic instrument. It is also uh, coupled with certain other Chinese strategic interests. There are uh, many questions about the impact of this currency on privacy of its users and how this would usher a new dawn or if it, it would not have any or uh, have any impact on the other countries which are exploring this sort of digital bank the digital central bank currencies and whether or not this project has anything to do with uh, chinese currency uh, being more used in international transactions beyond China. So I'm sure Professor Heng, as I have had the pleasure of reading his very comprehensive draft paper, uh, I'm sure Professor Wang would be exploring many of these questions. I look forward to Professor Wang's presentation and also to your questions, dear audience. Thank you all once again. Professor Wang, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh... Rizman, um, I, I really would like to, at the very beginning, to uh, express my sincere thanks to you and your colleagues for uh, having me uh, join these wonderful uh, events and also to the fact Department of Law, Law South University. Uh, um, what I'd like to uh, talk today um, is about the future of central bank digital currency and digital yuan and beyond. So what I'm trying to, um, you know, analyzing is focusing on China's central bank digital currency, what we call, you know, digital yuan, or people may call it DCEP, or, you know, um, uh, ECM1. 
And there are several questions, you know, which you can see uh, here that, you know, I would like to discuss. Why is that, you know, what is uh, China's approach to central bank digital currency? And, and secondly, uh, how to understand, you know, this approach and also what's its future? And also, I think that's also involved not only in China, but also other countries. Um, and here is a, a paper which I just finished uh, a draft and um, any comments uh, will be appreciated and you can download through scanning uh, the QR code here. And at the very beginning, I think I would like to explain that as we know that um, we are entering into a digital age and COVID um, um, has actually accelerated the shift to the digital age. And we see uh, you know, mushrooming of the private uh, digital currency like Bitcoins, you know, global stable coins, and on the other hand, we have those kind of the, you know, central banks which are thinking of their own digital currencies. China is one of the, uh, uh, you know, first um, likely to be the first major economy to issue a CBDC. However, we also see those other efforts by other countries and economies like digital euro. You know, and the U.S. is considering whether they will issue digital uh, dollar and so on and so forth. And I would like to see that actually we're able to see these efforts are actually can link with each other. Because if you are a kind of business, you are thinking of which currency you want to use uh, in international or domestic transactions, and also whether you are able to use that by, you know, um, by either traditional methods or you want to use that for, you know, a digital version of the payment. And of course, there are many issues involving not only end users, but also um, others like, for example, how do you deal with the issue of uh, privacy protection? You know, how do you fight against you know, illicit uh, finance and also how to deal with data? Because we see that uh, digital currency is very different from traditional currency because that generates data. You have a digital identity and also you have a lot of issues to regulate, how to regulate those kind of the, um, um, you know, currency. And let me start with a uh, so to wrap up and very to summarize the first point is that uh, China is a leader of the CBDC regarding of its you know pilots they're undergoing, and secondly, um, China CBDC has implication for other countries because you know they may have a choice of different currencies, and and also we are seeing a kind of emerging international standards you know in that regard explored by different international organizations. Third, um, you know, we're able to see a lot of complexity that involves not only traditional currency, but also uh, data, because, you know, you generate digital currency, generate data, and involving digital identity. And also the fourth point I would like to see that actually, um, these are kind of issues, moving targets, you know, so that means a lot of uh, complicates, complexity in regulation. Um, Let's secondly move on to the what China's ECNY look like. So here's a, a, a table which I adapted from the Deutsche Bank research that China take a two tier system. You know the central bank, People's Bank of China, issue this digital currency, and then you have a tier two, which are operating institutions. There are several major state owned banks like ICBC, you know Bank of China, and, and so on and so forth. And also along with two internet banks, you know, which are linked with the uh, uh, digital, uh, you know, big tech uh, companies like Alibaba and Tencent. And you know, so the central bank will issue the digital currency to the operating institution, and then the operation uh, institution will be able to open the wallet, the what we call the ECN1 wallet, and they will, you know, for individual users. And then they will also disseminate, you know, ECNY. They also be responsible for, you know, know your customer, you know, and, T and, and other compliance requirements. And then you have a tier 2.5 with uh, other banks, other payment service providers, and also other service suppliers, like, you know, they are uh, retail, you know, like uh, Starbucks coffee, you know, including other uh, Chinese uh, businesses, you know, DD. You know, which involves those, uh, um, you know, hailing services and so on and so forth. They're able to actually provide, you know, uh, services along with the ECN Yuan. And of course, at, and at say below tier one, tier two, tier 2.5, you have end users. And that includes, you know, businesses, ordinary businesses, you know, who are, for example, restaurants, you know, or 
uh, a seller of uh, of the you know products they may accept ECNY and also the consumers which will actually also uh, use the ECNY. So these are kind of the ECNY structure. Uh, if we look at the ECNY, we understand that it's been a kind of uh, two-tier operational system, you know, which means they're actually issued by the central bank, but also uh, rely a lot on the banks, you know, state-owned banks, other businesses to, you know, de to distribute it. So this is what we call intermediaries. And, and secondly, if you see it's a loosely coupled with bank accounts, what does that mean? It means actually, um, if it's a lower amount of the, um, you know, small amount of transactions, you don't really necessarily need to, you know, uh, link with your bank accounts. Um, and you can, you know, use, uh, as you will see the reports from the Beijing OTP games, you know, you use a uh, um, um, cell phone number uh, that you can use the ECNY. Um, and um, but for larger amount of transactions, they'll be linked with say bank accounts. The third aspect is managed anonymity, which means that you know um, usually the central bank is says use a centralized management system, so they're able to access the, the data while the um, operators or inter what we call intermediaries, you know, as mentioned, you know, uh, banks, uh, state-owned banks or payment service providers. Uh, they are they are able to they are only able to get some of their data of the uh, ECNY. So, for example, they are able to know who are the customers, you know, their own customers of these intermediaries, how they use, you know, ECNY. But they are not able not able to know what are the other side of the transaction because they may come from customers of another uh, firm. The feature. If we look into the feature of the ECNY, it's actually a kind of the strong role or strengthened role of the state. So which means that if you look into the operating system of the ECNY, you are able to see that you know, it's a top-down approach. So you, a easy way is to compare with Bitcoin or the private cryptocurrency, which are, you know, are opened or operated or initiated by private parties. And they are using a decentralized system. While if you look at the CBDC or China Sin Yuan, it's actually a top-down approach. It's designed by the central bank. And also the state has been a central role in terms of operation infrastructure, the link with different institutions, you know, the data and, and others, including standards, you know, how you use technical standards and also how do you open the wallet. And the second feature of that is you know, possible cross-border use of ECNY. According to a recent survey of the central banks, uh, including uh, People's Bank of China, and, and the PBOC, the People's Bank of China, has actually shown the interest to explore the cross-border use of ECNY. There are news reports that, you know, uh, China, you know, the ECNY may be used outside the mainland China. So Hong Kong is reportedly uh, to contact some pilots, you know, the using of ECNY uh, uh, according to news uh, reports. And also China is working with some other central banks, you know, and as well as the Bank for International Settlements to explore the, um, you know, the bridge, what I call MCBDC bridge, you know, linking different digital currencies. And so that's another effort that involve both wholesale and also retail use of the digital currencies. Um, and of course, that's, you know, uh, they're likely to be Used you know, for for the future if China's efforts has been uh, has go smoothly, but of course they also have a lot of issues to be addressed. For example, what are technologies will be used in to link different uh, currency systems, and to how does the different you know how do the different uh, central banks operate or accept those data? So that's another issue, and also how about the regulatory issues and so on and so forth. And thirdly, we'd like to see that uh, another feature that China has been active in international governance relates to CBDC. You know, China is proposing a number of uh, principles, you know, like no detriment, you know, promotion of interoperability among different financial systems uh, regarding the cross-border use of the central bank digital currency. So um, what I'd like to see that, you know, when we look into the features, 
as well as uh, you know the key aspect of ECNY. Then we are thinking of you know how do we see China's approach? Uh, I'd like to see that China's approach to uh, ECNY or CBDC is what I call a kind of synactive reshaping. Um, so it, what is the synactive reshaping? Uh, it means a synactive reshaping of international financial order. Um, it is uh, based on but different from synactive adaptation, which has been proposed by Professor Pitman Porter. Uh, in the past, you know, if we uh, understand when China joined the WTO, World Trade Organization, you can understand that's a kind of downloading. You know, China downloads the WTO rules, you know, adapt that to Chinese context. While in synactive reshaping, um, looks like China's been kind of uploading, you know, China's been uh, promoting uh, rule or principles for cross-border use of CBDC, and also China being active in international governance. It's kind of way where China tried uploading its uh, practice and standards to uh, you know, regional and extra-regional level. Um, and so what is synactive? Synactive here means, you know, for this context, it is about, say, digital currency. And also here is a, you know, central bank digital currency, the public one. And you may ask why China chooses this area. Uh, one of the major reasons is that China has a first move advantage, because if, if you look into this area, this lacking of international standards, you know, design, or experience on CBDC, while China has been moving quite fast, you know, in moving to a cashless society, a lot of use of fintech, you know, e-commerce. You can remember if you go to China, you see that you know, cash has been used uh, much less than than past, and people using you know, scan your know, QR code to pay for that. And China also being quite a uh, you know, uh, large businesses in area like e-commerce. So these are help China to to you know to be a you know take advantage of first move advantage um, regarding this area, particularly now regarding the CBDC. And secondly, it's about reshaping. So what is this reshaping of international financial order means here? What I mean here is that the if if the ECNY can be used you know internationally, they like to reduce reliance on US dollar by China. So, for example, ECNY or CBDC, uh, they are, can enable you know the transfer or the exchange of currencies you know without going through you know intermediary currency like US dollar or euro. So, um, uh, ECNY can enable you know uh, direct transactions or transfer of two currencies you know without going through US dollar. And secondly, you know um, China you know has advantage as mentioned earlier. In regarding technology and use of ECNY, because China is a large scale, um, you know, pilot of the uh, ECNY, it can have an uh, impact on the, you know, emerging technology standards in the regional or multilateral framework concerning fintech and CBDC. Um, uh, there are reports that China has been, you know, I, I think that's from China Daily that's you know China promotes some of their technologies among some economies of the. Built and role initiative. And also, thirdly, they may have other potential uh, impacts, you know, um, because not every country are able to design their own CBDC from scratch. So they may learn from what has been done by other countries. So they may have impacts on the design of CBDC by other countries, but also potentially a kind of emerging, you know, uh, uh, regional currency, you know, as well as say, uh, and so, for example, ECNY may be used in the region. Um, and so these are kind of the potential impacts, you know, um, the international financial order. So since we are talking about China's approach, it's a potentially uh, synactive reshaping of international financial order. And then the question is that how do we understand that? I mean, so here we see that actually um, it, I propose that there are uh, several uh, factors. You can see that uh, some of them, or many of them, has already been uh, used in this. You know, has been proposed originally by Pro Pitman, Professor Pitman Porter in the synactive adaptation. What I argue is that a there are new factors like you know conception, and two these factors will have quite 
different meaning compared with you know what happened in the past when China joined the WTO, which people argue you know it's a kind of this synaptic adaptation of downloading. So let's let me go one by one. The first one is perception and conception. So what does that mean? Our perception and conception basically means that you know how do you perceive and understand you know the pre-existing technology you know rules you know for example you know regarding you know digital currencies you know bitcoins and others and and how do you regulate so for example for cbdc you of course will will learn from what has been done regarding the regulation of the traditional paper currency and another aspect to that this is a conception conception means conceive so what does it mean it means that you know china is being um you know first mover uh the first major economy uh that is a uh, large scale pilots about cbdc you have to conceive which technology you will use you know how do you make sure that's secure how do you protect privacy how to address say potential cyber attack risks and so on so forth so this involves more the issue about conceive you know how do you develop your ideas you know how do you promote the the standards and you know address the challenges in, in its operation and the second major factor besides perception and conception is complementarity to which i argue that basically china's approach you know china's practice uh, cbdc practice is complement with china's preferences you know including China's role, enhanced role in international governance. China is a major economy in trade and investment, but not necessarily in currency because RMB has been relatively a smaller uh, market share in international use. And secondly, promotion of finance and trade. You know, CBDC may reduce the cost, you know, for trade, and that may be used for uh, by Chinese businesses, you know. And also in financing, in contexts like the BRI, there are some observation observers, you know, who argue that. And thirdly, another preference of China is to is to respond to the external dynamics. A easy example is the U.S.-China tension and the U.S. sanctions against Chinese businesses. You know, so there are incentives, you know, for China to develop a, a kind of parallel system. You know, and they may be also be used by other countries which want to. You know, uh, go beyond the U.S. dollar. The third influencing factor is about legitimacy. So, what is legitimacy means here is that you know, how do we regard it as being just? You know, has been well accepted by the by the people who are subject to the regulation. And here, legitimacy means both domestic, international one. I would like to see for international use of CBDC, international legitimacy is particularly important for China. So CBDC brings opportunities, you know, lower cost, you know, um, and you can also uh, potentially be more efficient, you know, but also there are many challenges, you know, policy risks, uh, operational risks, you know, or for example, how do you ensure security of the CBDC? You know, how do you make sure that the privacy will be protected? And also how do you address potential impacts on businesses? Because business may have less access to your data and that may you know increase your cost um in uh, and also they may be passed up on you know to some extent to the uh, end users so there are also a lot of challenges in that regard and i'd like to also to see that you know this is probably one of the final uh you know, i think the second last slides of my is to look into the future i think that's we talking about china's approach synaptic reshaping and the influencing factors, you know, perception, conception, complementarity, legitimacy. And um, and in the coming two or three slides, I would I think it's important to look at into different um, factors, you know, to look into the future of CBDC, not only limited to China's CBDC, why is economic factors, you know? So what are the cost of the CBDC means for businesses? You know, so businesses, for example, how do you recover the cost and, and make that sustainable? And what's the cost for end users? Secondly, that's also related to the impact on businesses and also the uh, markets. Um, so if here we see that the multi-factor uh, um, uh, framework, we see that economic factors, you know, 
and, and also they have impact on macro financial implications, you know, financial stability is one thing you have to consider. And, and secondly, the political economy factors, you know, how, what's the relationship between state and the market. And also I would like to see that also have impacts on currencies, you know, because you have a you have potential other CBDC, other digital currency, they may have a competition. And the final fact will be legal and regulatory ones, you know, how do you interoperate? among different systems, you know, think about CBDC and traditional payments financial system, and how do you adapt to the new context? How do you have international cooperation to maintain the, uh, you know, security of the financial system? And, and also, I would like to see the future. Inspired by the adaptive governance, I think that's the two aspects who could be useful to think about or access the future. Why is that about stability? So I think that objectives, why is that it won't be efficient? Another one is security. However, if you want to have enhanced security, that may slow down you know, um, uh, the process. You know? So there's a tension between efficiency and security. The same, you have a tension between privacy protection and the fight against uh, unlawful activities. And secondly, you have the issue about, you know, how to ensure financial stability and social stability. That includes, you know, how do you ensure the, um, you know, the market adjusts to the new context and the impact on businesses will be uh, fully understood and uh, properly addressed. At the end of the day, that involves the regulation and technology. You know? I would like to see that regulations um, in the past, we see that's been lagged behind technology. So technology goes first and then regulation try to catch up. But that'd be very tricky because, you know, um, since the digital age is fast developing, how the regulation will catch up. And another aspect is technology here. Technology will see a lot of uncertainties and there's no technology which is perfect. You know, a lot of uncertainties. So we are able to see that, you know, how do you deal with this issue? You know, how do you deal with technology problems? And secondly, is about adaptability. So adaptability here means that, you know, there are uncertainties in operation. You know, we'd like to see that CBDC is kind of, you know, uncharted water, no international experience, and they may have intended, unintended effects. So for example, what happened, it's been a natural disaster, cyber attack, you know, glitch in the system. Think about the issue like smart contract, you know, what has happened if the design error? So how do you deal with those uncertainties in operation? And also the adaptability also means that how to deal with local leads, you know, in your country or other leads across border, if you use that across, you know, borders. Um, so these are the, I think, important factors that will affect the future of the, um, of the ECNY or more broadly, the CBDC, different ones. And what I'd like to conclude here is that, you know, CBDC, uh, including Chinese one and other ones, is a moving target. So we'd like to see those kind of the competition, you know, of different payment solutions, different currencies, and the center will have the, the address issue, what's the proper role of the market and the government. And also, we'd like to see a rocky role for international coordination, because actually the CBDC reflects a lot of governance or regulator approach. So there's a lot of motivation or interest um, and capacity and so on and so forth. And if we look into the future, I think that's important to look into different factors, you know, efficiency and safety in you know, the issue of, you know, uh, how do you protect uh, maintaining the traditional role of the financial system while updating the role of the central bank and other regulators in the digital age. And I think that's important to have a forward-looking approach by different stakeholders, businesses, you know, uh, individual users who will be involved in the CBDC because it's um, often a fiat currency and also our uh, regulators. And we need to adjust to the changes and also the regulators probably need to move ahead of the changes. Um, and I would like to see that, you know, uh, what I analyze here is not argue for the issue or, or against uh, issue of the CBDC. What I try to, explain here is that these are the issues that we would like to explore and understand before we go to the digital uh, age. So I think that I would like to um, stop here 
and look forward to the uh, discussion. And thank you, uh, Rizman. Thank you, Professor Wang, for your excellent and I think very thorough and informative presentation. Now, the first question that I would like to put to you is, could we see this e Y or Chinese Yuan as a sort of new phenomenon of China trying to be a, a global standard setter in international economic law, or that would be too much of a overstatement? Yes, thank you. Uh, I think this is a, a very, uh, very good and also very timely question. Um, I would like to see that actually um, China has been uh, what I call a kind of the major economy in the world, and China has been wants to increase its role in international governance. I think that's also probably um, in terms of China's role, probably varies. Uh, so, for example, if you look into trade. You know, uh, they already have a WTO, you know, and also, um, you know, a lot of detail rules in WTO. And also, if you look into free trade agreements, you already have those kind of, say, you know, TPP and CPTPP and other ones. And, and China benefit from some of them, like, you know, lower tariffs and so on and so forth. And, and also, it's diff and, and so China is benef you know, benefit from the market access and so on and so forth. And, and secondly, China, uh, it's difficult to change those rules because already binding treaties accepted by many others. So for trade one, it looks like China has been, uh, you know, not really uh, a stand setter, you know, regarding trade rules you know, as, as a large. However, as I mentioned, for select areas, you know, for select areas of the international governments, even including some aspect of trade, like trade facilitation, you know, or e-commerce, or here we call, we look into central bank digital currency, where China uh, has a move, first move advantage, you know, because China is a major, um, first major economy to have a such a large scale, you know, uh, use of CC and one and two, China has been a, a leader in the use of the fintech, you know, domestically, and and also um, and also we see the data is king in the digital age. So it looks like that China has been uh, play a pretty important role, and also to affecting uh, the the emerging. Uh, you know, um, regional or international standards in that regard. And that also helps China, I think, uh, from Chinese perspective, to increase the, the role, the use of RMB in international business and transactions. Yeah. So that's probably explain the reason why, why China is being proactive in international governance regarding CBDC, FinTech, and others. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. The next question would be, well, maybe to answer this, you would need to have a crystal ball and without the <laughs> benefit of a crystal ball. How do you think the other initiatives that you have mentioned in your paper, uh, the other countries who are also thinking of some sort of CDBC, how would the ECNUI be different from those other initiatives? Can you pro project something there? Yeah, I think this... Uh... Another excellent question. What I look to see is that you know, CBDC reflects actually the currency, also reflects the governance model. So uh, you are talking about different approach to CBDC. I can give one example. Um, according to a recent uh, piece by you know the IMF, I think that's a behind the scenarios of the CBDC. They mentioned that you know, for example, China, some central banks, they use on the information you know a campaign or public information to promote the CBDC, while Swedish central bank, for example, when they, um, they focus uh, instead on the, you know, more transparency, you know, on the uh, or publicity of the CBDC work. So you see those kind of the um, uh, different approach, for example, how do you communicate, you know, with the, uh, with the, the public in the use of the uh, uh, CBDC. And also, I think there are other aspects which you can see the difference. So for example, um, what's the role of the state, you know? I, I, and also, for example, how do you design the data sharing? I think that it's probably early stage because, you know, we have, we're yet to see how the euro, you know, digital euro or the digital dollar will take off, you know, how to design that. But we already have discussion about different design, you know, about say data flow, how do you maintain it? Anonymity. So, for example, there are proposals that you know whether central bank does 
do not necessarily need to understand or get to know who are the users, you know? So maybe the data will kept at the intermediary or business level. So those are also the aspects, you know, data uh, regulation, another example where they may be different. And I would like to see that eventually trust and confidence uh, is crucial, you know, because, you know, you have to convince the people that, you know, it's secure to use CBDC until your privacy will be protected, you know, and, and, and that's a very important one. That's probably also relates on the governance capacity, you know, including the rule of law. So for example, if it is a infringement or if it's being, uh, you know, uh, if the operator uh, intermediaries, you know, go bankrupt, you know, how do you get to remedies? You know, if your data leakage, how do you get remedy out, uh, out of those situations? So I think that's the, the confidence in the regulatory capacity, you know, the governance and rule of law will be crucial and also uh, more, you know, transparency and also public engagement because CBDC involves, you know, affects a lot of businesses. And then it's important to understand what impacts on businesses, other stakeholders, and also to address their concerns and, and to be inclusive. So these are, are very important ones. So in the future, I think that the businesses and other users will like to choose the one they feel comf comfortable at the end of the day. Yeah. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much. The next question that I would like to put to you is, can these central bank digital currencies be used to, as a sort of tool for implementing uh, economic regulations? For example, that you use this kind of currencies for this kind of transactions, any set of yearly limit or anything. Do you see any desire on the part of China or maybe the other emerging CDBCs that you have studied? Could this be a tool for implementing some sort of domestic economic uh, regulations? Yeah. Um, yes, I think that's, um, that's a, actually a very important aspect of the ECNY and also other CBDCs. Um, because, you know, um, technology, uh, you know, can be used, for example, what we call smart contract. So it's kind of program, computer program, where you have preset conditions. So, for example, if you want to distribute uh, subsidies, you know, you can set precondition for that. You know, so, for example, this is used for first aid, you know, um, and this once uh, someone receives first aid, then the subsidy will be distributed to a hospital. You know, so these are kind of way of or other subsidies. And also they can be, you know, as this, I think that's a very important aspect of CBDC, also implementing or increasing the policy tools for monetary purpose, because you are able to track where money comes from, how it goes, if you want. Technologically, it's, it's possible. And then, um, you know, it's possible to, to, for the central bank to, for example, what we call helicopter draw. So you can, you know, send the money to the individuals at a, mass, a faster speed, you know, because they're involved in the CBDC. Central bank can directly affect that. Um, having said that, I'd like to see that, you know, CBDC also raise the concerns you know, uh, uh, lead to concerns. So for example, uh, if we look into programmability uh, or the smart contract, it also may require, you know, more private data, you know, more private information. So people may have concerns about, you know, whether my privacy will be protected. And of course, people may argue that, you know, basically the privacy under the CBDC cannot be comparable with cash because, as this example that you cannot hide your cash, you know, below your bed. That's that's basically impossible for the CBDC. So, and also another aspect that you know, uh, for the uh, economic regulation or the uh, public policy purposes, and then you have to think about you know how do you ensure the transparency and also issue like if you look into trade perspective, how do you ensure the non discrimination? Because for example you have different stakeholders, different entities participating into CBDC. How do you make sure that they are, they are treated in a fair manner, no matter domestic or foreign ones, whether they are first comer or late comers. So these are many issues that need to be uh, addressed. They already have some observation by other regulators arguing that the CBDC design shall not twist or distort the trade and other economic relationships. Thank you. Now, what about 
this transparency and CDBCs being used to combat, let's say, anti-money laundering type activities. Do you see any possibility that it may have some sort of impact there? Yeah. Um, yes, I think that's a, that's a, a major issue. I think that's in the design of CBDC. So, um, so to address those kind of the under money laundering, they ask for, you know, it's not many observer argue that it's not possible are not possible to have a complete anonymity. So that means CBDC is quite different from cash. Um, but of course, here we have an issue one, how to balance with privacy protection. Because you know that's a that's a very that's a very important aspect, you know. And two, um, you also have the issue about you know how do you uh, enable the international collaboration or you know because it, what happens if the cross-border use of that. So that's another aspect, you know go beyond domestic context. So I think these are issues that it's been uh, quite interesting to see how they will play out. That's various, I think, according to countries, and then also adds the complexities to international regulation and coordination. Thank you for that answer. The next question uh, that uh, we would like to put to you is about the BRI projects and the ECNY, ECNY, because you know China are involved, China is involved in too many mega projects in Asia and also in Africa. So could this ECNY be somehow linked to those BRI projects? If it could, how uh, could you share some thoughts on that, please? Yeah, I think that's been a, um, a pretty debate issue. You know, uh, there are different views in that regard. Um, uh, their observation or uh, that ECNY might be used along the belt and road initiative. Uh, so for example, if it's been um, a project, you know, conducted by Chinese businesses. You know? So for example, you could have a company, a Chinese company who has been, you know, subcontract of China you know, project, you know. So they may actually, if the two sides of the transactions, you know, so um, a track contractor, a subcontract by Chinese ones, they may use ECNY, you know, among themselves. And secondly, uh, there are also some uh, um, arguments that ECNY may be also used in, in law if, uh, if that involves, say, if other countries accept, you know, the uh, ECNY. Um, um, so they may be used in, in trade, in, you know, investment, and also in law. But, but I would like to see that actually they also have uncertainties. You know, why is that, you know, um, so for example, uh, digital currency is different. If you think about cash, it's easy. You use cash in other country, uh, other people accept it down. But for ECNY, you know, you need uh, facilities. You know, you need a wallet, digital wallet. You need um, terminals. You need equipment. You need technical system. You need internet, electricity, and and so on and so forth. And secondly, the CBDC involves data, so it's quite sensitive. You know, that involves monetary solvency, and a whether a foreign central bank. You know, allows the, the data to come into and out of their country, you know, and to understand the use of in their own country is another issue. And also, how do they want to share their data? So these are many issues that involve uh, not only, uh, you know, um, regulatory issue, but also technology issue, and also involve issues like different technical standards. Yeah. So these are the many roadblocks along the BRI. Thank you for that answer. Uh, the next question is from... Azin Wasi, he or she asked, what makes it special from other digital currencies? I think we have covered it a bit, but maybe you could share some more uh, thoughts on that, please. Yeah, and uh, thank you for the question. I think the first one is actually, we already discussed about difference in uh, among different CBDCs, because we, if you look at broad picture, we can classify into public uh, digital currency and private digital currency. So let's first look into public digital currency, which are CBDCs. As a uh, long story short one, I think that's uh, basically reflects a different governance model, you know, because the central banks, you know, will reflect, uh, you know, well, their approach will be affected by the governance model of different countries. So that's really why uh, it, it, the, the CBDC, you know, explored by China may not be the same with um, that explored by Europe. Um, digital euro. So, for example, you think about digital the data protection. You know, so the data protection of Chinese one, 
will be quite different, you know, from the uh, other countries. And also think about issue like, you know, if looking to issue related area like uh, server, you know, server localization requirements or whether you allow data free flow. So these are the one example to show that. And of course, that involves another issue like the role of the central bank. You know, so what are, is the central bank uh, independent from other you know, government agencies and so on and so forth. So these are uh, uh, the difference among different uh, CBDCs, which will end of day rely on the government's model. And, and secondly, if you look into private digital currencies, and you know, you can think of bitcoins, you know, the cryptocurrencies, or you can think of the global stable coins. And the major difference, you know, among CBDC and Zen is that you know, obviously um, private ones are largely you know, decentralized. So they are they are not really uh, the same with the CBDC, which is a top-down approach. You know, central bank is a center, it designs these uh design those um, CBDC. And in China's context, you know, the local governments also provides funding for lotteries, you know, so the users, you know, you can apply and, and, and through the lotteries, you may get a red pocket, you know, help you to use, incentivize you to use ECNY. So these are kind of, you know, top-down approach. While in, it's centralized by industry, uh, sorry, institutional design, uh, standards design, and the promotion of its use. While if you look at private cryptocurrencies and private digital currencies, they are, you know, they are driven by private entities and, and they are decentralized to a large extent. So you have the issue about, you know, take regarding governments. So CBDC are centralized, while private one decentralized. Having said that, uh, I don't mean that um, technology of CBDC is decentralized. So for example, China CBDC, it combines both centralized and, and decentralized technology. So for example, China allows intermediaries to use DLT and other technologies that are decentralized. So it's kind of hybrid uh, structure. So what I, to, to sum up, I, what I mean is that for terms of governance, CBD is centralized. Private ones are decentralized, largely. For technologies, this is not necessarily the case. CBDC can use both centralized and decentralized technologies. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. I think it does and does so quite comprehensively. The next question is uh, from uh, apparently a Chinese participant. Pardon my ignorance. Uh, I do not know the Chinese alphabet, so I'm unable to read the name. Uh, the question, uh, I'll paraphrase a little bit. It essentially asks you to shed some light on keeping the sort of balance between the role of the market and the role of the government uh, when it comes to the aspect of protecting consumers' data while they are using these digital currencies. Yeah, thank you, uh, Pen Ziqiang. I think that Ziqiang I, I is uh, for this uh, great question. Uh, it's nice to see the, uh, here. And actually, I think this is a great question because, you know, the role of the market and the government, um, you know, is a crucial for, it's a crucial issue in international governance and also including domestic governance. And of course, it's crucial for ECNY or CBDC because, you know, it's different from, if we link to the previous question, CBDC in Chinese context is quite different because you know everyone is supposed to use CBDC in China, the ECNY in China, because it's a fiat currency, while China prohibits private cryptocurrencies, you know. So um, uh, it's not uh, allowed to use. So you can see another major difference that it shows the role of the state. And and of course, the, the state's role is very important, or the government role is very important because the CBDC will affect the markets, will affect the business model, you know. And, and so, for example, you see the ECNY, you have a new app, you know, which has been, uh, you know, led by this, um, you know, CBDC e-wallet. Um, the ECNY wallet was designed by the PBOC. So, um, largely. So, you see, actually, it's a centralized system. And regarding how to balance that, I would like to see that it's important to be inclusive and transparent. 
you know, to engage with stakeholders, you know, to listen to what are their concerns, what are the needs for privacy protection, you know, impacts on businesses, you know, uh, impact on competition, and then listen to the potential issues and then address that in a transparent and inclusive way. So I think this, in this way, it also helps the general public and other stakeholders to have confidence, you know, to deal with this issue. Uh, to, to in this easy way. And secondly, I would like to see that, you know, it's also important to provide um, a rule of law system, you know, regarding in those issues. So as I mentioned before, if it's been a data breach, you know, or data leakage, how the consumers will be protected? How do you get compensated? You know, how do you deter further behaviors, further, uh, uh, you know, problems in that regard? So I think these are, some of the issues that we should pay attention to. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Wei Wei Dang. I hope that I have pronounced it correctly. The question asks, how could the ECNY digital wallet compete with Alipay or WeChat wallet in the future? It seems that there would be conflict of interest here. And how will the government deal with such, such a situation? Yeah, I think this is a, another great question. Uh, thank you uh, very much for that. I think, as we know, that Alipay and WeChat Pay are kind of you know China's uh, private uh, payments, digital payment systems, you know, widely used. Yeah? So they are uh, the dominant uh, players in the mobile payment markets in China. Um, so yes, I think this is an open question because at the end of the day, um, on one hand, uh, as we see that the uh, PBOC. And along with local governments, are active in promoting use of ECNY, you know, and, and that also helped Chinese uh, the state to be uh, in a, an important role in the in the digital economy, you know, because you know um, uh, they want to maintain their role in the in the economy, and also that involves many aspects, including data. On the other hand, the users may have you know they already past dependence, so they already being accustomed in using Alipay or WeChat Pay. So here's the issue that what are the additional value? You know, so I think that's the task of the ECNY is to show that A is, uh, you know, you really should have confidence because they have a protection of their privacy. You know, so they, they need, uh, you know, I think the more transparency will be useful. And two, I think it's also important to show what has a value, added value. Some of them is that, you know, um, ECNY will not charge uh, cost for end use individual user. But they also have arguments that you know the the charge relating to current payment system is not is relatively low, so they won't be make a lot of difference. So these are many uh, issues that uh, need remain open, and also um, how the government deal with that. I think it's it's important to again ensure the you know the the proper role of the government and the market. You know. Because that's in the long term, it's important to have a robust market, you know, that helps to econ economic development, that helps for the, you know, uh, the employment. When China's economy is slowing down, I think pay attention and support the market will be very important. But we'll see how the uh, the the approach of the CBDC involved in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And this would be the last question that we have for today's webinar, that what sort of a good role that you think the international monetary institutions can have on this uh, Chinese digital yuan or other uh, CBDCs uh, that may emerge in the near future? Can you uh, foresee anything on this? Yeah, uh, this is a fantastic question. I would like to see A, that I think it's important to have learning an exchange of the information. And that is pretty important because there's a lack of information or experience about uh, CBDC. And so that's very important to be uh, able to share experience. So that requires more transparency you know, among different CBDCs. In this way, for example, exchange on how do you address uh, cyber attack, potential cyber attack risks? How do you regulate tra uh, data? How do you allow it to flow? And secondly, uh, issue is that, you know, how do you deal with uh, um, standard setting? Um, so what I would like to see is that actually is a, a risk we are facing that's a race to the bottom. 
you know, CBDC should not be a platform race to the bottom. So I think that international organizations are crucial to maintain, you know, to establish the minimum requirements for privacy protection, you know, for cyber attack, you know, to, uh, to make sure CBDC is properly managed, is properly regulated, and for the benefit of everyone, instead of raised to the bottom that may cause issue like abuse, you know, or uh, other potential uh, disruption, or even, you know, this uh, disaster in the monetary system. Because if you can think about if a digital currency, CBDC, has a technical or cyber attack other issue, it will be a kind of huge blow in the confidence in it. Thank you so much, Professor Wang, for your answer and, of course, for your time and a very wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you, attendees, for your participation. The video recording of this program would be uploaded in our, on our YouTube channel. If you have missed any part of it, you are welcome to watch it uh, from the YouTube.